Number 33. What are the IUPAC names of the following compounds? And then we have A through E. So just know that the IUPAC names are the systematic names that we've been working with throughout this whole section. All right. So whether we use a Roman numeral, we have to change the nonmetal to IDE, that, that type of naming. All right. So that means that basically A through E are not in their systematic names. They're not in their IUPAC names. So we first have to figure out what they are, and then we will put them in their IUPAC names. So for A, they're telling us that it's manganese dioxide. Okay. So manganese can be found over here. It's a transition metal, right? So right off the bat, it's, let's just put this over here. These are our transition metals. Right, and then our main groups are group one and two main group metals, and over here as well, this is part of the main groups. So transition metals, remember, they don't have a standard number for oxidation state, so we will going, we're going to have to use a Roman numeral, all right? So technically, since manganese is a transition metal, we should see a Roman numeral here, but we don't. Instead, we see a dioxide right? And usually di, as you can see over here, that represents two, but that's prefixes for covalent bonds. So the, the naming is a little messed up, right? It's not the systematic name. So we first have to figure out what this compound is. Well, this is basically going by the covalent way of naming stuff in which you just call it as you see it, right? So manganese would just be mn, and now they're telling you that you have dioxide. Oxide is oxygen, and di tells me that I have two of them. So this would just be MnO2. So now we have to take this information and put the IUPAC name to it. So we have manganese, so that doesn't change, right? So this would be manganese. Oops, manganese. And remember, for transition metals, you just state the metal name, which is what we just did. Then we need the Roman numeral, and then the nonmetal gets the IDE ending. So I need that Roman numeral, and now it's just oxygen, so that becomes oxide. So there's no more dioxide, it's just oxide. But now we need the Roman numeral. And the Roman numeral is always the oxidation state or the charge of the metal. It's not how many you have of the metal. It's always the, the charge of the metal. So we can always find the charges, which were always in the upper right-hand corner for each atom, by crisscrossing back up the subscripts. So there was one MN here and two oxygens, right? So technically, this one, if I crisscrossed it back to oxygen, this would tell me that oxygen is a minus one, and this two would crisscross back up telling me that manganese was a plus two. So I'm over here now, Mn plus 2 and O minus 1. You should always double check your negative charges because you will always know that one. If it doesn't match, we have to basically unsimplify the charges. Now, how do we know if this is a negative 2? We go by the oxidation state trend, right? The charge trend. And the charge trend is only for the main group elements. So it's either going to be 1 or 2 or 13 through 18. So you probably are familiar with this. Group 1 is a plus 1. Group 2 is a plus 2. Group 13 is a plus 3. 14 is plus or minus 4. And then you go backwards. So negative 2, negative 1, and 0. So oxygen being here should be a negative 2 charge. But it's a negative 1 here, which means that it was simplified. So we have to unsimplify it by multiplication. What number times negative 1 will get me the negative 2 that oxygen needs to be? I'll times it by 2. But I got to be fair. If I do that to oxygen, I have to do it to manganese. So I have to times that by 2. And now the charge for manganese becomes plus 4. And that's the number that goes in the Roman numeral. So 4 is IV. And that would be the IUPAC name for manganese dioxide. It would be manganese four, because that's the charge of the metal, oxide. And then A is done. 
Now B. We can fit B down here. We have mercurious, mercurious chloride. And actually, they tell me what the compound is. So you know what? I'm just going to erase this because we could just work off the compound. Sorry about that, guys. So this is a, um, HG2Cl2. Okay. So this one looks not challenging, right? But there's a little trick to it. Now, I see that I have mercury. And mercury is over here. It's part of the transition metal. So I know that I have to have a Roman numeral because I don't know what the charge of the transition metal is. So let's just start it out. It's the metal name. So that's mercury. Roman numeral. And now it's Cl, which is chlorine. So that's a chloride. And now we just need to know what the Roman numeral is, right? Now here, you might think that, okay, well, there's two and two. So this two crisscrosses to chlorine telling me that it's a negative two, and this two crisscrosses up here to tell me that it's a positive two. But look here. Is chlorine's charge a negative two? No. This is a negative one. Chlorine will always be a negative one in this situation. So that's not the right crisscrossing, right? So that means that there's... Well, that means that mercury actually is acting as a polyatomic. And just know that mercury 1 is always going to be HG2 with the 2 plus charge. So if I treat mercury 2 as a polyatomic, I will say that I have one of these and two chlorines. Now if I crisscross the 1 up, that would bring chlorine to be a negative one and this two to be a plus two. That now checks out because chlorine is a negative one. And uh, mercury with always a two on the bottom and a two plus up top is always mercury one as per what the polyatomic state. So this one was a secret polyatomic question. So this one was tricky. It was mercury one chloride because it was acting as a polyatomic. So just be careful and just remember that, you know, mercury could have a polyatomic to it. Don't forget about that one, all right, guys? Okie dokie. Moving on, we got C, ferric nitrate, but they give us the nice little compound, so I'm just gonna take that, FeNO3, three. So we have Fe, which is iron, and iron's over here, it's a transition metal, so I can say that this is iron. And now I need that Roman numeral because it's a transition metal. And now I see that I have NO3. NO3 has multiple atoms to it. So that's a polyatomic, polyatomic ion. And it's nitrate. Nitrate is the NO3 one. That comes from memorizing, all right? So NO3 is nitrate. And polyatomic names never change. So it's going to be iron something nitrate. We now have to find the charge of iron. And that comes from crisscrossing. So there was one iron and there was three nitrates. This one crisscrosses back up to tell me that nitrate was a negative one. This three crisscrosses back up to tell me that iron was a plus three. So I have Fe plus three with an NO3 minus one. Always double check your negatives because that's the one that you will know. Was nitrate a negative one? Yes, nitrate is always a negative one charge. So if this one is true, this one has to be true. And that's the Roman numeral that you put here. So this would be iron three nitrate. All right, so that's the end of C. And now we have D, titanium tetrachloride. So here we go again with seeing tetra where it shouldn't be, right? Tetra usually is four for covalent compounds. So this one kind of has the same thing as what was happening with manganese dioxide. So we will treat it the same exact way. We got to get the formula first. So titanium is a transition metal. That's TI. And now they're telling me that it's tetra, which stands for four chlorides, which is chlorine. So 
titanium Cl4. I have four chlorines. So now I have to take this compound and write the actual IUPAC name for it. So just like before, titanium is a transition metal. So I just write the metal name. So this would be titanium. And then you have chlorine. So now there should be a Roman numeral in between them because titanium is a transition metal. And this would just be chloride. It would not be tetrachloride anymore because that's not used for ionic bonding. And now we just have to find out that metal. That comes from crisscrossing. So I had one titanium, four chlorines. This crisscrosses up telling me that titanium was a plus four. This one crisscrosses telling me that it was a minus one. So it's Ti plus four and a Cl minus one. Does the negative make sense? Yes, it does, because chlorine should be a negative one. So that means that the plus four makes sense as well. So this would be titanium four chloride. So I'll just write that over here, titanium four chloride. And now let's just quickly erase just so that we can do the last one. Do, do, do. And then we have E. So E is cupric bromide, which is Cu. Br2. So Cu is copper. Cu is over here. It's a transition metal. So I state the metal name, which is copper. Since it's a transition, I need that Roman numeral. And then I state the non-metal name with the IDE ending. So bromine would turn into bromide. Now I got to figure out that Roman numeral. So I have to undo the crisscross, right? There was one copper and two bromines. So this one crisscrosses up telling me that bromine was a negative one. This two crisscrosses up telling me that copper was a plus two. So I'm just gonna rewrite that over here. And always check your non-metal, right? Should bromine be a negative one? Yeah, because bromine's right here, it's in the negative one group. So if this checks out, this also checks out and that's the charge that goes here. So this would be copper two bromide. And that's it. E's done. Number 33 is done. And I think this is the last question for all of your nomenclature questions. So that's pretty exciting. So if you haven't done the ones before, go back, do tons of practice for this. That's how you get really good. And just a quick tip, memorize your prefixes, memorize your polyatomics. Um, know the ins and outs of where your metals and non-metals are on the periodic table. All that is going to help you out, not for just this chapter, but it's going to come back. N stuff in chemistry always comes back, all right? So always got to keep it in the, in the front of your brain, and you guys will do awesome on your tests and quizzes, all right? So thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys all in the next question. Have an awesome day, and if you wouldn't mind, and if you want to, click subscribe. Not only will you get the answers directly to your feed, but you'll be helping out the channel and getting the word out to everyone all over the world who uses OpenStax. So we kind of build a community and yeah, hopefully we do bigger and cooler things in the future if you guys will let us and we'll see you all in the next question. Bye-bye.